Thank you. Be seated, please. This is the second Sunday of the season of Advent. That's Brad, Brooke, and family to come here and to light today the candle of peace. Today we light the candle of peace. Picture a man named Abraham. He was 75 years old and married to Sarah, who was also well along in her years. They had been married for a lifetime, yet they had no children. God came to Abraham in his old age and said, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let's be clear. God was asking a lot of Abraham, leave everything you know and go to a place I will show you. Put your trust in me and I will bring to you a place that will someday be known as Canaan. I will make you a great nation. You don't have any children yet, but just trust me, you will. Yes, God asked a lot of Abraham, but God promised Abraham even more. He promised descendants, blessings and protection on the journey god asked a lot promised a lot and abraham had faith as he embarked on this journey he put his trust in god and god gave him peace the peace that filled abraham as he embarked on a very unknown dangerous and difficult journey is the same peace that god offers to us today in the midst of our unknown dangerous and difficult journey god asked a lot but he promises so much more. What peace.
As we continue uh, with our worship today, I want to share a word from the Lord, from His Word. <clears throat> Isaiah 9. Um, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged a nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at the time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered and bur the burdensome yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff on their oppressor, just as I did on you. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let's pray. Lord, what an encouraging and reassuring word today. Your kingdom shall never end. God, we are so grateful that you made a way for us to rest knowing that we can be a part of your kingdom. We're grateful that you gave your one and only son, Jesus, to pay the price for our sins. Father, today, we gather because we love you. We gather to thank you. We gather to praise you. And Lord, we gather to worship you in spirit and in truth. It is in Jesus' name that we pray today. Amen. Messiah 
Messiah, name above all names. He's my blessed Redeemer, and he's Emmanuel. I hope that this Christmas season that we get the words that he is your Redeemer. I pray that if you're his child, you understand that. I pray if you've walked into this room and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior before you leave here, that God will do the work of salvation in your heart. For he's the only one that can save. His word says, Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He is the only way, and he is the only truth, and he is the abundant life that is possible for everyone who knows him as Lord and Savior. When I sing that song, he is my blessed Redeemer, and he is Emmanuel. He is God with us, or as Brother Don shared in a staff meeting, God is with us. You realize that God is still with us, right? He's omnipresent. He's in this room. And if you're a believer, he sent God the Holy Spirit to indwell you. So I want to invite you tonight for a night of carols. at 6 o'clock in here. Um, every song we will do is a Christmas carol at its core. It'll have some extra things pulled in on some of them. But we'll want to be in this room tonight at 6 o'clock to have a time of worship as we sing the songs of Christmas to our Lord and Savior. So that's your personal invitation to come back tonight and to be a part of a great time of worship where you're going to have to sing some, okay? It's, it's not just this group up here. We want to hear all the voices lifting up praise to our Lord. Let me pray for us and then Brother Carter will come. Lord, I thank you for this time of year. Lord, I, I guess it's just looking forward to, to uh, Christmas and, and what that meant so long ago that it makes me realize who I am or who I was before you saved me. And the fact that anything that I am today is because of your grace and your mercy. And Lord, I guess that's why I love Christmas so much. Lord, I pray for every person in this room. Lord, I thank you that, that my friend Isaac was able to come back from South Korea. Lord, I thank you for, for him serving our country in such a way and for all of our servicemen around this world, uh, some that are in harm's way more than others, but Lord, they're all sacrificing this time of year. And Lord, I pray that you would be with them as they serve us. Lord, you say that the power of the sword is in the hand of government. And Lord, they are just an extension of the government. And therefore, they are ordained by you to be where they are. But Lord, I thank you for his friendship. I thank you that he is back. Lord, today my heart is heavy for areas of West Tennessee that got hit by the storms and, and the lives that were lost. Lord, we pray that the peace of God that we just read about in our Advent reading, Lord, would descend on those areas, Lord, in some supernatural way. You, you promised that all things are going to work out for good for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. Sometimes our human minds can't really grasp that, but you are God and you can do that. And I pray for all the families that have lost loved ones. I prayed for those who are in the hospital, Lord, that you would heal them. I pray for those that are in our congregation that are in the hospital, that you would continue to heal those that are going in even tomorrow for procedures. Father, I pray that you would be with them. Lord, above all, I want to thank you for Jesus. And as Brother Carter comes, Lord, I pray that you would just fill him to the overflowing with your Holy Spirit so he could preach what we need to hear today. Right, everyone? Speak through him, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Be seated, please. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can open up to the book of Esther. We're going to try to get to Luke 2 with a stop in Micah in there. So uh, we're, uh, we're going to be well-traveled uh, throughout our Bible today. 
Uh, I'm going to try to do the entire book of Esther, uh, which uh, should be quite the uh, experience. Uh, we'll try to, try to move quickly. Uh, so Jamie read this Isaiah 9 text earlier, and there's a prophecy found therein that I find striking and something that I probably have not pondered enough. But there's a line in there where he says, a child will be born and the government will be upon his shoulders. And you think about what that line means. What does it mean that the government will be upon this child's shoulders? Well, I don't know about you, uh, but I don't feel very influential uh, in the government. Uh, I don't know that ordinary folks like you and like me uh, have much of a say in there as much as, uh, you know, our uh, high school social studies classes would have us believe. Uh, But this is not a political message. That's not what I'm here for. Um, The title of this is Christmas for Esther, Bethlehem and Ordinary Folks. So this entire Advent series, we've been looking at uh, some average Joes. Now, if you're in here right now uh, and you're new or you're visiting with us, you are in uh, a room of very average, very ordinary, mediocre, uh, just decent people. That's it. (laughs) Uh, and maybe worse. Uh, but the whole point is that Christmas has something to say for all of us. That this Christian story, what makes it so unique is that it is not for people of a certain class. It is not for people of a certain economic status. But instead, the Christian story is for all of us. And therefore, the Christmas story is for all of us. We looked at uh, Adam and Eve and how sin entered the garden. And from the very first pages of the Bible, uh, this plan from God was enacted to rescue his people. And this rescue plan was put into motion. And so therefore, when you come across little Moses uh, upon his birth and his mom faithfully uh, trying to preserve his life and through this reality that God is continuing to move his rescue plan forward through ordinary, unlikely people uh, like these three women that we read about last week from Exodus. We pick up today uh, and we are going to look at some more ordinary people and ordinary places. Uh, My boys and I watched um, Annabelle's Wish. Uh, Does anybody know that movie when I reference it? Uh, it's a little like hour-long animated film. I believe I watched that. I remember being in like second or third grade and watching it for the first time. Uh, but it's about a, a, a little <laughs> a cow. <laughs> it's about a cow named Annabelle. And uh, our, she's on a farm, and uh, there's a little six-year-old boy named Billy who can't speak. And uh, Annabelle gives this magic gift of voice to little Billy. Uh, But either way, uh, in the story, the narrator is uh, none other than Randy Travis, of all people. And uh, in the very beginning of the movie, he says, uh, Christmas on the farm was simple, but in the city, simple was never enough. And I just, uh, it's not lost on me that there's a little dig there uh, for uh, city folks uh, from Randy Travis himself. We live in a day and age where it's sometimes hard to think that you and I are very important or you and I have a lot of control. Uh, We live in a a day and age where the little man never seems to be able to get ahead, right? Uh, I think this is why this uh, people usually, I don't know how many of you have seen the the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, uh, but one of the reasons it's such a beloved film is, right, the idea of an average Joe, just a a guy like us could make it to Washington and, and tell it how it is. But the fact is, that can never happen, right? It never happens. Who speaks for us? Who is there for us? And again, this might sound like I'm stumping, uh, but I'm not. I am here to extol and talk about the one who has already come and will come again. The king who is on the throne forever. The kings and kingdoms and all kinds of emperors have tried to make a name for themselves and did, but are now dead in the ground and remembered only in history books. But our God lives Our king is on the throne, and he looks at people like you and me and says, you're exactly who I want to build my kingdom through. I don't need you to to achieve a certain status. I don't need a certain type of person. All I need is willing hearts, humble, broken spirits to fall before me and understand that I am the best thing for you, and I love you, and I'm with you. And so that's what we are going to look at today. This government will be on the shoulders of this boy now, to understand really the, the nature of Christmas and why it is such a big deal is because the Israelites were looking for their rescuer to come, the Genesis 3, the snake crusher who would defeat evil. 
But they thought that he would come and he would establish this earthly kingdom, a kingdom that looked like, uh, you know, Israel in its heyday or any other earthly kingdom for that matter. But Jesus has come to establish a kingdom not of this world. And so as you look through the pages of scriptures, kingdoms and kings, they come and they go. But Jesus comes and says that I'm doing something differently. And so because his kingdom is not of this world and because his kingdom is founded upon uh, himself and his life and his power, uh, we do not have to fear. It will not be shaken. It is established. And this is what we can take comfort in. It's the main idea of today's message is this. God wields the kingdoms of this earth to move his forward. God wields the kingdoms of this earth to move his forward. So in the book of Esther, right, I'm going to try to fly through it. Uh, I'll give you a little backdrop there. Uh, so God's people, he establishes the nation of Israel. And you read this Old Testament book, and it's just full of some incredible pictures and, and stories. But the reality is the, the Israelites, as a nation, did not exist for a very long time. They did not have uh, this extended period of being a powerful kingdom. But instead, as they turned to false gods and the gods of the land around them, God continually said, turn back to me or I'll have to punish you. Turn back. I will not stand for this. And he was slow and he was patient and he was kind to them. And yet at the end of the day, the people still took advantage of that kindness and turned to false gods. And so eventually God allowed them to be captured and so over time, the, the nation of Israel was captured by a number of uh, different empires, uh, but eventually they were taken over by the Assyrians, who were captured by the Babylonians, who were then captured by the Persians, who were then captured by the Greeks, who were then captured by the Romans. Uh, so if you know your uh, world history, uh, this will be a, a fun um, text for you. Uh, but within this framework, uh, specifically, that book of Esther picks up during the Persian uh, Empire. And there's a king there named Xerxes. Now, if you have seen the movie 300, uh, I'm not supposed to reference R-rated movies, uh, but, uh, you know, there it is. Uh, the movie 300 is uh, a, a slight picture of what happens during the, king, uh, the reign of King Xerxes. But either way, he is uh, the emperor over Persia. And uh, the movie 300 depicts the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, all very interesting stuff. Uh, but either way, the Jewish people had become entrenched in this life of exile. They did not have this firm grasp on life back in Jerusalem. They did not believe or, or think that they would ever kind of migrate back there as a nation and exist. It seems like they had grown complacent in exile. In the book of Esther, I mentioned this last week, uh, but one of the things that sh stands out about the book is it never mentions Yahweh. It never mentions God. It never mentions uh, the God that's behind it all. And that's the, this creative storytelling technique designed to get us to look at the details and see, okay, what is God doing throughout this book? Uh, and so I think four, uh, four points to take away from it uh, to kind of, again, I'll have to fly through it, but we'll, uh, we'll get it done. The first is unlikely royalty. God is going to establish this unlikely royalty in this place. Now, if you have read the whole book, you know the story. This queen, Vashti, she is uh, not going to play ball. Uh, her husband wants her to dance uh, and entice a bunch of men, and she had enough honor and dignity to not do that. It hacks off her king, and so he deposes her and throws a beauty contest, and he wants a new queen. And so all the unmarried women of a certain age are brought to the king. They're prepared for a year uh, to go into this beauty contest and see who will win the king's affection. We meet this woman named Esther. Uh, now, in Greek, her name is, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in Hebrew, her name is Hadassah, which means myrtle. Uh, and so it's a great name. Uh, and so Esther, she's being raised by a relative, Mordecai. Uh, and she is uh, living in this kingdom, uh, an orphaned girl. And little by little, all of a sudden, she finds herself as the queen. We'll just read in verse uh, 15 of chapter 2. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus, which is also Xerxes, 
uh, into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is, in, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. Feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Sounds like a good feast. Um, maybe our government could hold one of those. <laughs> uh, but either way, this, uh, this begins in the palace of a king. And within a couple of chapters, this orphaned, exiled girl somehow winds up being the queen. This text shows us that she wins favor from everybody, the king's eunuchs, the king himself, everybody in the king's palace. They're enamored with, with this girl, Esther. She must have been um, just a, a great person. Now, God is never intimidated by our circumstances. His people in this book are in exile. They've got little to no standing, no power. And yet God looks at this and he sees, I can work with this. I'm not intimidated by the most powerful king in the known world at the time, uh, having my people restrained and having authority over them. That doesn't intimidate God. He can take this orphaned little girl and make her into the queen. He continually takes things that seem like they ought not be, and he makes them vessels of redemption. Now, every false god in the world is always portrayed with statues or, or stories of power and how they're so strong and uh, they can overmatch anybody. They're usually unable to be tamed. They've got tempers, and, and everyone's terrified of these gods. I had a coach that once told us uh, that we should never brag or act like we're very good because if you have to tell people how good you are, uh, you really aren't that good. <laughs> well, in the book of Esther, you see that our God, Yahweh, the one true God of the Bible, he doesn't need to go around parading how great he is. Our God is confident in his own power. He's not scared by the kings of this world. And so he looks at this story and he says, yeah, here's Xerxes, here's the most powerful king in the world, he's got the best military, and I can still redeem my people through that. He doesn't have to use the people in high places, God can use anybody. He can use an orphaned exile, he can use a baby in a manger, he can use people ruined by sin in places like Savannah, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, we don't control the stock market, yeah, we aren't our own super pack. We don't have a bunch of stores and malls and chain restaurants to go to all around us. Yeah, everybody in here has made mistakes and feels ashamed of those mistakes. Yes, we don't hold positions of high power, but that does not intimidate God. That doesn't worry God. It doesn't scare him off. You and I are still valuable to him. So whether it's Nebuchadnezzar or Cyrus or Xerxes or anybody in Washington, D.C., God tramples the proud but gives grace to the humble. Unlikely royalty lifted up to a place of authority to help out in the rescue plan. Well, you and I are not the rescuers, but we have a place in the rescue plan. You and I, orphaned by sin, cast out, ruined ourselves, and yet God looks at us and says, I can still use you. You are not in the discard pile for me. Just like he elevates Esther here, so too can he use people like us. All right, unlikely royalty. There's also unseen danger. So the story progresses on. Esther's uncle Mordecai, he overhears this plot to kill the king from two of his bodyguards. And Mordecai kind of tells that story forward. And Esther makes sure that the king knows it. And the plot's uncovered. And Mordecai's a hero. And then a more dangerous situation comes up. A man named Haman is placed into a position of authority. He's honored and he's feared by all and he wants everyone to bow down to him. He's like a, the vice president or something like that. And he's honored and feared by all but one man, Mordecai. So everywhere that he walks, Mordecai refuses to bow down to him and it drives Haman crazy. Now, one of the fascinating things about the Jewish people, now if you ever go back and look at your world history, every nation that ever takes over the Jewish people says, we got to leave them alone. 
They are so stubborn. They will not bow to our gods or our people. They are intensely monotheistic. They have this one God they believe in. They will not bow to others. To where eventually they arrive at this point, every nation ever, where they said, we just got to leave them be. Because we're just going to have to fight an ongoing war. You know the story of Hanukkah, right? It was just going to be perpetual Hanukkah if you force the Jewish people to bow down to other gods. And so uh, this is true in history, and it's true in the story of Mordecai. He will not bow down uh, to Haman. And so this infuriates him. And we pick up in chapter 3, reading verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries." So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. So Haman plots a genocide. Haman plots to exterminate the Jewish people because this one man won't bow down to him. I'm here to tell you, okay, one of the biggest reasons that you should believe in God and believe that he has authority and that he has been at work in human history forever is the fact that the Jewish people still exist. Now, obviously, there's a lot of geopolitical issues going on right now. I'm not here to offer commentary into any of that. That's not what I'm good at. Uh, I am saying that God took an old man and his barren wife and gave them a miracle baby in the desert of the Middle East around 2000 B.C., and here we are, thousands of years and thousands of attempts at genocide later, and we're still talking about them. Like, you don't think God had those people selected and had a, a reason for them and a point? And so I would rather not form my political agenda to look like what Haman is doing right here. And so I'm not a policy expert. I don't have the, a word from the Lord about defense strategies and land rights. Um, but I do think the Jewish people have had a unique hatred pointed towards them since the days in Egypt. A lot of times that has come from the church itself. You look throughout the Middle Ages, the, the church in Europe was particularly heinous towards the Jewish people. And so here's the point. Whether it's the serpent of Eden, the pharaohs of Egypt, or Christian kings in the Middle Ages, Haman, whoever, God is not thwarted by others to snuff out his people. Can they accomplish much evil? Yes, absolutely. Humans are capable of much evil. Do they do a lot of bad stuff? Absolutely. Towards the Jewish people, yes. But they have not been snuffed out. God's people have persevered. And so Haman here has gotten in the way of God's rescue plan, and that is not a smart place to be. You never want to put yourself in between God and what he wants to do in terms of redemption. That is a scary place. That is a place that is not going to end well for anyone. And so Haman uh, thinks that he has risen to power. And we, who often feel so powerless, just like Mordecai here, so helpless, actually in some roundabout way, all things are working together for our good. The king gives Haman his signet ring, which is basically giving Haman the authority to do whatever he wants to do in the name of the king. But... There's one thing Haman is trying to do that God cannot tolerate. Haman wants to exterminate Jewish people everywhere. The king of Persia, uh, Xerxes, he's king from like India all the way to Europe, essentially. And what Haman is saying here is, I want all the Jewish people, in a year's time, that's his plan, in a year's time, we're going to enact the final solution. We're going to kill every Jewish person in the known world. And there's a problem with that. The snake crusher from Genesis 3 is to come from these people. And so even though this looks really bad for the Jewish people, even though this looks really bad for the Genesis 3 prophecy and so forth, the serpent crusher is still coming, and nothing's going to stop our God from redeeming. And so you wind up with some this, the unselfish intercession of Queen Esther. Flip over to uh, chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 13. Mordecai learns of this plot. He puts it forward to Esther. He says, hey, you need to intercede on behalf of the people. And at first, Esther says, well, I haven't seen the king in a month. 
hadn't talked to him, haven't been with him. Uh, and Mordecai responds to this. Now, Esther's worried because uh, if she approaches the king uninvited, their court procedures were that she would be put to death if the king so willed. But Mordecai says this in, in verse 13 of chapter 4. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai and Esther's responses here are incredible. Now what does Mordecai tell her? You're probably going to get caught up and die in this whole thing too. Don't think because you're the queen that you're going to escape what the king has decreed here. But then what does he say? Deliverance will rise up from somewhere else. Mordecai, in some form or fashion, knew the Genesis 3 promise, knew that a rescuer was coming, knew that God would rescue his people. Mordecai does not live in Jerusalem. He does not seem to know or care deeply about uh, religious practices. We never hear of him doing anything uh, regarding worship of God, but he knows that a rescuer is coming and that nothing can stop him. And so he essentially says to Esther, do you think that these circumstances are so that you'll live in luxury or comfort, or do you think that God has another plan for you? And Esther's response is just remarkable. If I perish, I perish. I had a professor once who uh, said that they had a couple of students from Iran, um, and they had moved to America and uh, were going to seminary. And they were studying, and they were excited, and they were going to uh, pastor and, and, and minister to other Iranian and, and Muslim communities in America. And as they were going through the seminary process, uh, one day they met him in his office and in tears said, we feel called to go back, to go back. And uh, of course, obviously, Iran's a very closed country to the gospel, and, and uh, it would be an offense to openly share it. And uh, my professor said the, the wife of the couple, uh, through tears, just almost above a whisper, said, if I perish, I perish. Just the sweetest, most resolute reality that some things are worth trading in the comforts of this life for. That the glory of God and other people coming into God's kingdom and seeing God glorified is worth whatever momentary luxury or comfort that this world provides. And you consider the broader picture of this story of Jesus who enthroned in heaven did not count equality with God as something to be held on to but emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and came to this earth and obeyed to the point of death even death on a cross. Jesus did not say, well, I'm going to hang back in heaven. He came here and said, I've come to perish. He came here knowing that this was his purpose. He came to destroy the works of the devil by becoming a curse for us. And so in the unlikeliest of intercession in this story, this brave, orphaned, exiled Jewish girl is the unlikeliest of rescuers, so too is the unlikeliest of rescuers for you and me, a baby in a manger in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, Middle East. And yet that baby becomes the rescue for the entire world. And that leads us to the fourth point of this story, an unbelievable rescue. Skip forward to chapter 8. So Esther prepares a banquet, um, and there's this kind of back and forth song and dance. She prepares a feast. She invites Xerxes and Haman to the feast, and then uh, they have such a good time. She says, hey, I'll have another feast for you, uh, and they come back the next night. Uh, in between, uh, Xerxes wakes up in the night, and he's bored, and so what does he have done? Uh, he has a history book read to him. Uh, which is a great way to fall asleep. If you got problems sleeping, just wake up and read history books. Uh, put you right back. Uh, and, and in the midst of this history book, they say, hey, there's this guy Mordecai 
who uncovered a plot on your life. And he says, oh, we should rescue, we should honor him, we should do good to him. And, uh, and this dramatic irony, uh, Haman ends up leading Mordecai around on the king's horse, uh, praising uh, Mordecai's name. And so it's uh, incredibly dramatic. But either way, at the second feast, Esther unveils the plot against the Jewish people that Haman has put forth, and Xerxes is furious. He goes off and he calls for Haman's execution, and the very design to eliminate God's people becomes the tool used to eliminate Haman. You see the irony of this story? You see how crazy it is that like this writer, most uh, early scholars thought it was Mordecai himself, is telling this story, uh, and it's a dramatic irony that goes on. But if you read in verse 8 in chapter 1, he says, on that day, or on verse 1, he says, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. So you see that the unlikeliest of royalty, the unselfish intercessor becomes the ruler over the house of the enemy. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Skip forward to verse 7. Then King Ahasuerus gave, said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regards to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. So after all this hoopla, all the threats, all the death that was coming for the Jewish people because this signet ring that Haman used to destroy them with or to order their deaths with, um, now is in the hand of Mordecai. Now the very thing that was supposed to spell their doom has become to th the thing that's going to give them life and so Mordecai, with this ring, operates for the king. He calls for the Jewish people all over the known world to have their freedom and their lives preserved. And so what has God done? What has he done in the most roundabout way? Could God have just said, all right, I'm going to raise up a Jewish guy, and he is going to be six and a half feet tall, the brawniest of men, the best sword fighter, and he's going to capture everybody. He's going to rise to the top, and he is going to rule in my name forever. Could God have done that? Sure. Uh, what does human nature tell us? That will always lead to a tyrant. That will always lead to someone too proud, thinking they're hot stuff and that they've got it all figured out. And so what does God do? He continually works through the humble. He works in the unlikeliest of ways, through the unlikeliest of characters, to bring about his redemption. And so God takes the most powerful king in the world, whom the Persians believe to be a demigod, and he uses this king Xerxes to preserve his people and guarantee his rescue plan. Now, after the Battle of Thermopylae, right, the whole Spartan pushback, the movie of 300 and all that stuff, all right, after that, uh, Xerxes pulled back a ton of his people. Like, he thought, okay, we can still just capture the uh, Athenians and the Spartans. Like, we'll be all right. We'll take over the Greeks, no problem. And so he goes back to Persia. And meanwhile, the Greeks rise up and push back the Persians and completely recapture their territory. Now, why is this important? Well, it doesn't make sense that Xerxes would go back. It's kind of baffling. It's a bad tactical move. He goes back, and what happens? The events of the book of Esther like, why would this king stop in the middle of an offensive and go back to start this beauty pageant <laughs> process? Well, what do you think's going on there? Who do you think is pulling the strings of this story? Who's in charge of what's going on? God has preordained this to happen. And meanwhile, the Athenians push back on the Persians, paving the way for the Greeks to rise to power, who then get captured by whom? The Romans, and they take over. Now, if you are a history nerd, you're loving this. If you are a weirdo math person, you're probably asleep. Uh, but either way, uh, this is incredible how God works through these realities. Now, a couple of hundred years before this whole story happens, 
God, before they were captured by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, God's telling them, hey, I don't want to have to send all of this discipline your way. I don't want to have to raise up all these foreign kingdoms to come and take you over. I want you to turn back to me. I want my people to worship me because I love them and I'm good for them. And the people wouldn't do it. And one of those prophets, one of those people speaking on behalf of God, telling them, stop the sin, stop the idolatry, honor God. One of those was Micah. And in Micah 5, he says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. And so in the midst of this prophecy, in the midst of this promise from God that I will punish you, I will discipline you, I will not put up with the idolatry forever, at the same time issues the promise that I am still going to come back for you. I'm still here to rescue you. I'm still going to come for you. And so he says, you're going to come. This ruler will come from this tiny little town, too little to constitute a clan, a township. It's this little village in the middle of nowhere. And it just so happened to be where Jacob's first wife, Rachel, was buried. It just so happened to be a town where a foreigner named Ruth moved with her mother-in-law to marry a man named Boaz, who had a son named Obed, who had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David, who would become the greatest king of Israel. In that little town of Bethlehem, after the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and Greeks and Romans all took it over, was just a middle-of-nowhere hamlet, forgotten by anybody that matters. Nothing big would happen somewhere like that, except something big had to happen there. Something big was prophesied to happen there, the birth of the rescuer, the snake crusher. Now, almost 100 miles away, a little pregnant girl named Mary miraculously conceived with child, the snake crusher in her womb, she had to go to Bethlehem if that prophecy was going to come true. Now, how would she get there? How was she going to go? What could motivate a third trimester woman to walk 90 miles? And uh, it was hot. I, we had a baby in August, and... Uh, I don't know if there's anything, like it was tough to, to see, uh, you know, Amber had to say, go ahead and start the car and turn on the air conditioning <laughs> uh, to make that short trek. Like, it is hard. What would motivate Mary to do that? Well, in a Roman court, there was some tyrant, Caesar Augustus, who thought he was a god. Rome was a republic, a, a representative of their people. Until this jabroni comes along and says, no, we're an empire now. And my dad, Julius Caesar, he was a, he was a god. And I am his son. I'm the son of God. And I want to know who all is in my kingdom. Just how many people do I rule over? How powerful am I? I want everyone counted. Tell me where they are or they die. And this man, Joseph, looks at Mary and says, we got to go to Bethlehem. And they make their way there. And because in some Roman court somewhere, some power broker was undoubtedly telling Caesar, you're the greatest, you're the most powerful of all time, you come across this in Luke 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Just like Xerxes' movements Caesar was unknowingly, unwittingly paving the way for God's Son to enter the world, fulfill the prophecies of old, and to take away the sins of the world. 
Christmas shows us that small places and small people like us matter to God and that all the governments of this world, every market, every industry, every vote, every atom of the universe bends to the will of our God. And that census report came back to Caesar and told him of all the millions of people that he ruled over. And he probably thought long and hard about that, how great he was and how much tax dollars would come from them. And Caesar probably thought, I'm hot stuff. And on some scroll tucked away in some office, there was a record of a boy born in Bethlehem. And what Caesar did not know is that soon enough he would die and he would be forgotten to a scroll as well, but that boy would grow up, and he would be a man, a perfect man who would take away the sins of the world. And he too would die, but he would not stay dead, but instead would resurrect back to life. Death could not hold him. And through the love and affection that God has for his people, he has restored all those who will follow him back to life. Now, Caesar Augustus did not know this Jesus. He did not know that he lived and did not know that he was important. He died. But you know what? Augustus' successors knew about Jesus. And they tried their hardest to stamp out his followers. They did everything they could to remove the name of Jesus from Roman life. And guess what? They failed. And kingdoms have come since then. And kings and emperors have tried to snuff out the name of Jesus and his followers every step of the way. And here we are in 2023 talking and praying and singing and glorifying his good name. You know why? Because God uses small people in small, ordinary places to move his kingdom forward. And this little boy on this scroll in some office, born in Bethlehem, he would have his father's signet ring, (laughs) the ultimate king sent to do his will and lead others to him. An orphaned, exiled girl in a Persian court intercedes and becomes the rescuer for her people. A little boy born in a manger stall in Bethlehem rises to sit on the throne of God. He, come, he came once, and he will come again for his people. The child in the manger now sits on the throne, and Christmas tells us that he will come again. Let's pray. Father, this story reveals to us something incredible about you and is that you are at work in the details. And every kingdom on this earth can scheme its way to power, but ultimately they will all fail. And then we, the people of your kingdom, can proudly say we do not belong primarily to the kingdoms of this earth, but we are residents of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that is established through Christ and for Christ and held together by Christ, our ultimate king. And just like Persian kings and Roman emperors, to present day, people think that they hold the power, but ultimately they all serve the living God, that you wield the kingdoms of this earth to move yours forward. So whether it be an election year or a a market volatility, all the things that this world loves to act like can hurt us and scare us and intimidate us. Our God has tasted death and defeated it once and for all so that death, just like it could not hold him, will not hold us. And so the worst things that could happen to us will not happen to us because they have been thrown into judgment forever. May we honor you and revere your good name this Christmas season. May we wonder with amazement at the story you have written that has been in motion from the ancient of days. Our God is on the throne. May that give us tremendous confidence and hope that our future is secure. Thank you for that, God. We ask these things in that precious baby boy who grew up to be a rescuer, a crucified king. We pray these things in his name, Jesus. Amen.